Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, How to Prevent a Global Crisis from Becoming a Personal One, Stress Management in High Stress Times. Please remember to keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. We will, be we will try to be mindful of your time today and stick to the one hour that we've allotted for this webinar. With that being said, we won't have time for live Q&A. Please feel free to use the chat box for questions or email me at kbarksdale at sheriff.org and I'll be sure our presenters get your questions. My contact information as well as the presenter's information will be at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. For our introduction today, I will pass it over to Senior Program Specialist from the COPS Office, Nazmiya Khamri. Good afternoon. Thank you, Christy. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today um, for this presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time um, an hour today to join us. Um, as Christy said, my name is Ms. Mia Comrie. I'm with the Department of Justice Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, the COPS Office. We're thrilled to be able to sponsor this, and you're going to hear a little bit more about the Collaborative Reform Initiative. Um, and on behalf of Director Phil Keith, we welcome you to today's presentation and look forward to feedback um, on our survey after the fact. Laura, I'm going to hand it off to you. Great. Thank you, Nismia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Wilt. I'm a program manager with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. I thank you all so much for taking the time out of your busy days to join us. This is obviously a very critical topic, and we wanted to be able to bring something um, and share some knowledge with the field today relative to stress during these really critical times. I currently oversee the CRITAC here at the IACP alongside a phenomenal suite of, of partners that are other law enforcement peer associations. You'll see on the slide we have all of our partner logos here. Um, and today in particular, we have NSA leading the effort on this webinar, and we are also joined by our partner FOP. In a broad space, CRITAC is a national training and technical assistance center. I'm not sure how many have heard of CRITAC, but if you haven't heard of us before, we hope that you'll take some time to learn more about us, as we are a space where agencies can come and receive customized training and technical assistance in any number um, of topics, so wide array, over 36 topic areas. What we're doing here today is an example of us creating a resource for the broader field um, during a time based on a need that was identified with the critical space that policing is in right now. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Chelsea. When we get to the end of the presentation, you will see a website for CRITAC, and we really encourage you all to take a few minutes, check out our website, connect and internally in your agency, and, uh, and identify whether there's a need that CRITAC can help your agency with. Chelsea? Thank you, Laura. Uh, next slide, please. Before I introduce you to your speakers today, I will give you a quick uh, overview of NSA. Chartered in 1940, NSA is a professional association dedicated to serving the Office of Sheriff and its affiliates through education, training, and general law enforcement resources. NSA provides these resources and advocacy for sheriffs, law enforcement, criminal justice professionals, and their communities. There are currently over 3,000 sheriffs nationwide. Our membership base includes over 13,000 individual members, including sheriffs, deputies, other law enforcement officers, public safety professionals, and concerned citizens. Next slide, please. Now to our presenters. We have three presenters today. David Cunnington is a licensed professional counselor employed by the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department since 2007. He manages the, the professional wellness section, which was cited as a model officer wellness program in a 2019 Department of Justice congressional report. He provides therapy to law enforcement personnel and their families. He is a certified officer wellness instructor, and he leads critical incident stress debriefing. David has over 30 years of experience working as a clinical psychotherapist. Next, we have Dr. Kimberly Miller, who's a licensed police and public safety psychologist and sought after speaker and consultant who has been inspiring and motivating individuals in this profession for over 16 years. Dr. Miller owns her own consulting firm, Kimberly A. Miller & Associates, LLC, and has worked with over 150 public safety organizations and provided training for tens of thousands of students around the country through her local, regional, national, and online training programs. And our first presenter today is Sherry Martin. Sherry serves as the National Director of Wellness Services for the Fraternal Order of Police. 
the largest representative organization of law enforcement officers in the United States with over 354,000 members. As a career police officer, Terry has extensive experience in crisis negotiation and intervention, serving most of her law enforcement career as a patrol supervisor and lead crisis negotiator. While a member of the Charleston Police Department in South Carolina, uh, where she served the bulk of her career, she achieved the rank of lieutenant and was responsible for the development of programs in the areas of officer wellness and crisis intervention within the community. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Terry. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, so glad to see everyone here. I'm going to uh, start off today by telling a little bit more about um, the Fraternal Order of Police and our Division of Wellness Services. Uh, we have a committee of folks that works with me in the Division of Wellness Services that are uh, career, pol career police officers, FOP members, uh, and they, uh, our organization is based on a mission of improving the lives of police officers in whatever form that takes. Um, we learned a good deal about the power of surveying our members. Uh, a few years ago when we conducted a nationwide survey of our members in the area of behavioral health. And um, what we learned is that because we're such a large organization and because uh, we are not affiliated with any administration, responses to any survey that we might put out garner a strong response because we're trusted by members of law enforcement where there might be an area of stigma uh, or something, you know, like that, as we see related to mental health topics, our members weren't afraid to share uh, their thoughts in our anonymous survey about mental health and behavioral health and the things that they were facing in the profession. So we learned from that the power of surveying our membership. Um, we have 350, now over 355,000 members in all 50 states, the United States. Um, and as, as uh, Christy said, we're the largest representative organization of rank and file police in this country. And we have active and retired members, so we're also able to survey retired members and kind of gauge what sort of things they went through in their careers and what they're still going through as retirees. So um, given the current climate, several months ago when the pandemic started, uh, we wanted to take the pulse of our membership and find out, you know, what kinds of things they were dealing with around the pandemic and what policing was looking like for them as related to the pandemic. And I'm going to share some, some of the statistics uh, with you that we learned from this current survey. I want to stress that this data that I'm going to provide today is early data. The survey is still open. And what that means is that as more people respond to the survey, the statistics may change over time. But I wanted to be able to share with you some of the statistics today so that we can see kind of the trend that things are taking. Um, what we, what the FOP is going to do with this information is we're going to develop programming and let it inform the way that we set up um, initiatives to help our membership, to help members of law enforcement cope with stresses around the pandemic and now, and now around the other challenges that law enforcement as a profession is facing. So um, given that, we, what the, the uh, graph that you see there in front of you on the screen compares uh, officer stress in normal times, so normal times pre-pandemic and then since pandemic. And we asked about both the, the stress that the officer's facing and their opinion of the stress that their family is facing. So the blue bars you see there are pre-pandemic. And what, what we asked was, uh, how much exposure to stress did you have uh, in normal times? And so the blue bar indicates the percentage of officers that indicated they had some high stress or very high stress pre-pandemic. So, you know, that's a small percentage, 29% that you see there of officers that felt that they were very stressed or somewhat stressed pre-pandemic. Uh, any, any others that responded said they had lit, low stress or, you know, um, average stress, but 29% before. However, since the pandemic has started, that number has shot up dramatically. Those that are experiencing very high stress or extremely high stress. Uh, same with families. So, you know, we, we uh, as we develop wellness programming, we realize that the family uh, situation has a huge impact on an officer's wellness. And we as an organization feel a responsibility to take care of that officer's family as well as them because that's a picture of an officer's whole wellness. Um, 
we asked about uh, how much exposure to the actual pandemic officers had. 80% uh, of the respondents to the survey thus far say they have had some to very high exposure to the pandemic. 27% they've had to say they've had very high exposure to the pandemic. So this is like, you know, going out every day feeling that they're exposed to the effects of the pandemic. Not, not per se the mental health aspects of it, but the actual pandemic itself. Um, of, of the officers that have responded to the survey, one third of their agencies had had an officer diagnosed with COVID and about eight and a half percent had had an officer die from COVID within their agency. So that in itself, would we could see how that would create some extra stress. Um, so um, what we see here as a trend is that obviously the pandemic and, and some other things probably along with it since that have, have caused stress levels among officers to increase significantly. Um, when we asked about what was causing the stress for the officers, and we, we gave a range of choices there to choose from, um, the thing that caused the most stress for officers was fear of infecting their family members or partners. And when we look at the, you know, we, there was a range of options there. Does this thing that we're, you know, whether it's um, fear of, you know, are they enforcing restrictions on the public or lack of PPE? We asked the respondents to rate whether it caused them a little bit of stress, no stress, you know, moderate stress or very high stress. The fear of, of infecting the family member or partner most often was ranked as a very high stress item. So our officers we see are not so much concerned about their own welfare, uh, which, you know, is an interesting commentary on public opinion, what it seems to be, you know, what officers are feeling about, you know, being judged by the public and the fact that most officers uh, that we see still are out there serving and they're thinking of others before themselves. You know, fear, of, one of the choices uh, for what's causing the stress was fear of being infected with the pandemic, and that was the most lowly endorsed one. So officers aren't so much scared that they're gonna get it, but they are afraid that they're gonna carry it home and affect their family. And then secondly, um, rated more of a somewhat stressful um, uh, entity of this pandemic was enforcing those restrictions on the public. And so what may be contributing to this, we know, is that, you know, there may be um, things that police officers are being, are being asked to do because of the pandemic, enforcing mass restrictions, uh, enforcing quarantine type things, especially at the beginning of the pandemic that, you know, they felt maybe weren't necessarily within the scope of their duties. Uh, it caused extra strain on them to have to enforce those things on the public. So. Um, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing to you that these are early data, but these are the trends that we're sharing with you. Um, we, you know, we, in each question, we gave uh, respondents the opportunity to kind of, you know, respond in a range where the range of their stress was. Um, family stress was, um, you know, very high. Again, a lot of these things. We asked, you know, uh, what, what the uh, respondent thought that their family stress long-term would be compared to, you know, and their personal stress long-term as a result of the pandemic. And they said that although they thought that their uh, stress long-term might be somewhat higher, they feared that their family stress might be significantly higher. Um, so some other key findings from the survey. We asked um, respondents to indicate which critical incidents they've been a part of before. So, you know, had they ever been exposed to an officer-involved shooting? Had they ever been exposed to a line of duty death? Had they ever been exposed to a suicide of a coworker? Um, and, and then we asked them to compare that stress after that critical incident to the stress they felt during the pandemic. For over half of the respondents, they felt that working the, during the pandemic is more stressful than the stress they felt after that critical incident. And so, you know, there's a number of ways that we can look at this. Some, most often, critical incidents are short-lived. They, uh, you know, they occur and then we're able to move on from them in a relatively quick period of time, hopefully. Uh, the pandemic, however, has gone on and become a protracted incident, if you will. And so if we compare it to other critical incidents, it's sort of like over and over and over officers are being exposed to this and it's, it could turn into a, a protracted critical incident if we look at it that way. Um, and then the next thing is 
that, you know, another key finding is that we asked about how the officer's agency is responding to the pandemic, if they felt that their agency was adequately, adequately supporting them. And as you'll see here, over half thought their agency was doing a good job of providing that PPE, making sure that they, their physical danger, you know, was, was brought down. But we're still not paying as an industry as much attention our, our respondents feel to mental health. Only a third felt like their agency provided adequate support for those extra stresses that they were feeling because of the pandemic. Um, and again, I emphasize one more time that the survey is still ongoing, um, so that so the statistics could change. But we feel like the trends in the data are pretty telling about um, the kinds of things that officers are experiencing. And so, given that, um, what the mission of the FOP is to take this data from our membership and learn from it, and you know use it as research to apply to practice, to make recommendations for agencies that we can, um, you know, put data behind and show what changes need to be made to help our officers better cope with things like that. Uh, I want to mention here a paper that uh, my colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Drew, who's actually in Australia and I drafted. Uh, and what we did in this paper is we compared pandemic <clears throat> to a critical incident. So we looked at, you know, the background research behind things like 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, and the mental health impact that those types of incidents had on officers um, right after they happened and then in the long term. And what we find is a few things. Um, sometimes the, the effects of having gone through a situation like that or a tragedy like that are delayed mental health effects or protracted mental health effects. And so based on our research of, of those incidents, and the mental health interventions that were made for officers after that, we made some recommendations uh, about what agencies can do to better support their officers through the pandemic. To, you know, and as we bring in now uh, the other the other things that law enforcement is the other challenges that law enforcement is facing, um, how they can support their officers because this is going to be more of a long term response. Um, you know, so not just agencies, but then um, you know. FOP lodges, if you're out there listening, some of these things you can adopt to do within your lodge. Individual officers, especially if you're in a leadership role, you can take some of these recommendations, uh, put them into practice. You know, ask your members of your agency, of your lodge, of your squad, of your group, uh, what they're facing. Don't be afraid to have that conversation with them. Ask them about how their families are doing, because we know that that is a key thing that officers are concerned about. They're worried about how all of this is going to affect their families. Um, you know, as we said, over 40% believe COVID is going to impact their well-being in the long term. Another third of respondents is not quite sure if it's going to impact their well-being or not. But more than 50% agree that their family will be impacted long term by the extra stress that's being placed on them uh, during this time of the pandemic and the protests. Um, and just as a side note, although we're basically focusing on COVID today, we did put a few questions into the survey a little bit further down the road to ask about some of the effects of the anti-police sentiment, the uh, calls to defund the police, and the impact that those are having on officer mental health. And what we're seeing in the early trends of that is that those are having a very significant impact on mental health for our officers, even if um, they don't have, per se, a, you know, a protest or an anti-police movement within their own community, the things that they're seeing in the media um, and, and in mainstream are causing the, uh, causing a, a negative impact on their mental health and their well-being. So, um, you know, but just a few more recommendations. You know, we need as a profession to keep track of what's happening with our officers, not just, you know, let's say a miracle happens and the, and the pandemic is over tomorrow. Um, we may still see long-term mental health effects uh, for our officers, even beyond the end of the pandemic, as they still cope with things that are happening now. Um, you know, we, uh, we also um, talk about sometimes, I've had a couple questions in the last few weeks, rates of police suicide are down this year from previous years, which is excellent. And I've had someone ask me, you know, why do you think that is? And, you know, we can all speculate on why it is, but my feeling is that police officers are, have been very, very busy over the last few months dealing with the pandemic, dealing with the other, um, you know, social unrest, the other, all the other demands that have come from law enforcement in the last few months that they haven't had time to take a look at other things in their life that might be stressing them out. 
Um, you know, I think the takeaway for us is that mental health and wellness programs not merely be a checkbox that we check. This has to be an ongoing conversation. And so that's the FOP um, Division of Wellness Services goal is to keep this an ongoing conversation. So um, with that, I'm going to um, hand this off. Thanks, Sherry. So I'm going to start by sort of piggybacking on what she shared so brilliantly with y'all, talking about balance and stress management and wellness. And why is that so difficult? Well, she talked about the COVID pandemic and the anti-police sentiment and defunding the police. Those are right now, in this moment, huge stressors on law enforcement. If you looked at her data, they were significantly more than what officers experience on a regular basis. But what y'all are really experiencing and what agencies are experiencing around the country is a compound effect. So this is hard already. Y'all already have a super difficult job where many people don't like you on a regular basis and more people don't like you right now. Plus you're worried about the pandemic and infecting people and stress with your family and all of that. But regular stressors are things like identity. Many people in public safety have a singular identity, which means every single thing is about work. So that's where you put your effort and your energy. And when you put everything into work because you identify so strongly as a public safety professional, this doesn't leave a lot for yourself or other people which can lead to isolation, despair, and depression, and then obviously thoughts of suicide potentially. And y'all know that more officers die by their own hand than are killed in the line of duty. And that's actually one of the reasons that I stepped into the wellness world and created my curriculum is because not only do I wanna help every officer at every level and every part of their career become more resilient and more balanced, but I'm very passionate about ending first responder suicide. So beyond the regular stress, the other time I really see officers in this place of stress and pondering suicide is when they think about transitioning out of the role. Because many of you have that singular identity, when you think about retirement, though it sounds attractive, there's also a lot of fear. What am I going to do every day? What's my purpose for waking up? If I don't have a badge and a gun and I go hang out with the people in the places I'm comfortable, what does my life look like now? And I'm sure y'all heard the rash of suicides at NYPD, and a few of those people were fixing to retire. So we have to make sure that, as Sherry said, we take care of officers in their lifetime of the job. And we need to make that a priority, not just a check the box phenomenon. So other things that make identity, multiple identities hard. When you have a 24-7 job, you have huge responsibility that is often life and death. And your culture, though there's so many great things about law enforcement culture, the traditional culture with law enforcement in terms of wellness is suck it up. Don't have feelings. Move on. We all see bad stuff. And that pushing that down, that message that y'all get, push it down, push it down, don't talk about it in part has created the crisis that we've had today. We have not intentionally taught officers how to be resilient. We haven't created space for them to work through their emotions. And that makes this compounding effect of stress way more dangerous. Additionally, there's this addiction that we have. And if y'all have never read Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement by Kevin Gilmartin, I highly recommend that book. And Kevin talks about in the book how people get addicted to the work, right? Because when you're at work, you fill up and you're, you're high and adrenaline is flowing and, and you're all on top of everything. But then when the singular identity, you dump all your energy there. So when you come home, that's crash time because your body cannot live at that hyper excited level all the time. So then you come home and you crash. You don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to do anything. You just want to beer and sit in a magic chair and watch TV. And you're done with your words. You don't want to help it with the kids. You don't want to cook. You don't care what's for dinner. You don't want to make another decision. And so he says what we end up getting many times is this addiction to the job. 
So you associate the job with being having fun, with being up, being in a good mood, being productive, and you start associating home with being down, with crashing, with not having energy. That leads many people to problems in their relationships. And then what happens? People want to be at work because work is fun and home is not. This also leads many people into affairs because, right, the fun people are at work. If you go home and talk about people at home and deal with people at home that talk about the mortgage and the kids and other bills, and it's not fun. And finally, this is probably one of the most powerful things. If you don't see it, you can't be it. And one of the other crises I see in law enforcement is nobody has good role models. As I teach around the country, I always ask, how many of you can raise your hand and tell me you've had an exceptionally good role model about self-care, wellness, and resiliency? And I think in all of my years of teaching, I've had two people raise their hand. And nobody else has had a role model. But all of you on this call today can start stepping into that and be that role model. And I'm going to go through these really quick. What are the consequences of lacking balance? And y'all can read these. I don't need to read them to you. And these are very similar to things that Sherry talked about and that Dave is going to talk about too. These are all the consequences. And it's way better to be proactive than to be reactive. So how do we keep you super? <clears throat> and the reason I say super is I truly see y'all as the superheroes of the world. And my job as a police psychologist, I see my role is to help you stay super, to learn how to be better, to learn how to be more balanced, to learn how to be more resilient. The first part of this, I believe, is learning how to navigate negative feelings. Now, none of us like having negative feelings. They're uncomfortable feelings. They're things that we don't like. But if we don't learn how to manage them and navigate them, they're going to sabotage us. But they can actually serve us if we choose to use them as a GPS, right? So what does a GPS do? It takes you from where you are and leads you to the destination, wherever you're headed. So in terms of negative emotions, we want to go on that journey to work through them so we can let go of them and get to a better place. So next time you have a negative emotion, especially if you're in a recurring space, of anger or frustration or depression or disappointment. I want you to ask yourself, which of these four reasons is bringing up the negative emotion? Because we only have four reasons that we have negative emotions. The first one is lack of self-care. Now, all of you have woken up on a random day and just been frustrated before you get out of bed, just been angry just been irritable and just been in a bad mood for no other reason than you're exhausted, you haven't had a day off in 30 days, you've been working overtime, you've had to teach the kids, take care of the kids, cook all the dinners, you're just done, you're just crispy. So when you realize it's self-care, then make a plan. And I don't mean take a vacation in six months. What can you do that day? Can you go to bed early? Can you listen to some positive music or a positive video? Can you take half a day off and use your comp time? Like, what can you do right then to start building more of your self-care? The second reason that we end up in negative emotion is we have an unmet need. What I mean, what I mean by that is you don't feel loved, you don't feel supported, you don't feel appreciated, you don't feel valued, you don't feel um, included, you don't feel considered. And many times when those things happen, for whatever reason, we stay stuck in the anger or frustration or disappointment, and we don't get down to that need level. We don't say to somebody, look, the reason I'm so frustrated is you made a decision about my team, and you didn't include me in that. You didn't consider how I was going to feel. And if you can get down into the need level and have that conversation, then the anger can sort of dissipate because you're now talking about the source of the anger. The next reason is that somebody violates our value. What do I mean by that? Somebody disrespects us. They lie to us. They aren't 100% honest. They betray a confidence. We have very strong values as humans, and especially in law enforcement. Y'all are very strong in your values about what is right and what is wrong. 
And what can send people immediately up into what I call the emotional tornado is somebody violates a value and they're just immediately escalate to 100. So again, when that happens, start talking about the value violation. Don't get stuck in anger. Talk about it and say, look, the reason I'm so mad is you violate a value. This is what's going on. That is not appropriate, whether you need to set a boundary or whatever. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, what if I ask for a need to be met? Or what if I ask for an apology and they don't do it? Well, that's their stuff, not your stuff. Being resilient means you speak your truth, you set boundaries, you do whatever you need to do, but then you move on. You've got to find a way to let the negative stuff go because I've seen this eat people alive for 20 and 30 years holding grudges against other people in the profession. Now, the last reason you end up in a negative emotional state is mindset and story. I'm not going to explain that right now because I'm fixing to get into that in a minute. But overall, once you figure out the origin and once you navigate whatever you have to do, you need to ask yourself, how do I need to express these? I can't act like they don't exist. And a part of that is you have to learn how to de-escalate yourself. You have to say, what do I need to say? What do I need to do so I'm not screaming at the person when we have a conversation? And it's interesting, there's a lot of push for de-escalation for officers to de-escalate other people, but it's rare in a class where officers are first taught how to navigate their own negative emotions and de-escalate themselves. And the last part is, what's it going to take to let you go? What, let it go. Let the emotion go, right? Because if people don't apologize, if people don't care if they violate your values, what's it going to take to let it go? So you've got to figure out those things and do those things so that you can move on. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is mindset. And this is absolutely critical. Everything in, the, in our lives, I believe, comes down to mindset and how we look at the world. So number one, I want you to be aware of your diet. I don't mean fruits and vegetables and meat, though I want you to eat healthy. But I want you to ask yourself, what are you feeding your mind with? Who do you hang out with? Do you hang out with people that are negative and complain all the time and are threat assessors 24-7 and always look for what's wrong and what's broken and how somebody done them wrong and they complain all the time? Because if you hang out with those people, that's who you're going to become. Next, I want you to look at your media and your electronic diet. I can tell you now, especially now, please don't watch the news. There is nothing good waiting for you there unless you want to be angry or be afraid because that's the feeling that the media portrays. Here's what to be angry about. Here's how this is going to threaten you and what you should fear. Please be on a diet with social media, with the news, all of that. There is nothing good waiting for you there. Additionally, I want you to be on a diet in terms of your electronics. Nobody needs to be on their phone 24-7, scrolling social media. Y'all don't need to be on your phone, on email 24-7. And I can tell you, if you look at email at 11 o'clock at night, there's nothing good waiting for you there. You will find something that you'll read, and you'll be mad that you need to asleep, and then it will be a huge problem. Additionally, with mindset, I want you to understand that every thought you have leads to an emotion. So. You end up in this space of this neurochemical addiction. So if you're in a negative mind space and you always think bad things and negative things, you become neurochemically addicted to continue to think negative and feel negative. And the work of this is you have to think beyond your now. If you struggle with depression, if you're in a negative mindset, you have to start challenging yourself to look for the good and feel positive emotions because if you don't challenge yourself to step out of it, you're going to perpetuate the same place that you already are. So how do we train our mind? Well, number one, you need to understand the power of now. Now, the reality is most of us live either in the past or the future, right? So we're in the now, and in Colorado, it's 1234. So I'm going to ask you, are you here right now, fully involved in this webinar? Or are you thinking about dinner? Are you thinking about something that happened this morning? Are you now thinking about the person you've been mad at for 30 years? Or are you right here? Because the reality is all we have is the now. You are actually never happy in the past, and you're never going to be happy in the future. The only time you are happy in the past was a now moment where you're happy. And the only time you'll be happy in the future is a now moment when the future rise that you're happy. So don't wait. Don't say I'm going to be happy when the pandemic's over. 
Don't say I'll feel better about myself and our profession when the hate and the protest stops. You've got to find a way to feel good now. So how do you do that? You work on your perspective. Instead of saying things are happening to you, say things are happening for me. Because what if every challenging, difficult thing that has ever happened to you or ever will was only showing up to make you better, was only there to help you look for the gift and the lesson, if it was only there to show up as a test for you to improve your character and your coping skills, what if all the challenging things had a hidden gift, something that would serve you? Then you would respond to challenges in your life way better. Too many times we hold on to things that don't serve us, and it contaminates our mind and our outlook and how we show up. So make sure you don't let the negative stuff stick from life and from other people. A few other things. Please find a way that you can turn off. This doesn't mean hanging out with all your buddies and drinking beer and complaining about the office. Because I know public safety people tend to hang out with public safety people. Please have non-work friends. Please have people that are going to talk about golfing or hunting or fishing or hiking or going to the beach, something that has nothing to do with work. Additionally, think about where do you feel restored? Is it the beach? Is it in the mountains? What's your go-to place? And at least once a quarter, try to go to that place, even if it's just for a few days. I also want you to think about cultivating silence. Our world is noisy. Everybody's on their phones. Everybody's on media all the time. There's noise, noise, noise. Find a space to cultivate silence, even if it's 10 minutes in your patrol car in the parking lot or 10 minutes sitting in your driveway when you're home. Find a space for silence because it is so healing. Additionally, create your own reality. And I talked about this a little bit with mindset. But practice gratitude. Watch positive videos and music. Read scripture and hunt the good all day. So I'm gonna leave you with a few office ideas. So broken windows theory says, if you have broken windows or places in disrepair, you will get much more of that. So I encourage you, clean your space and clean your brain, because I'm sure at least some of you on this call have an office that looks like that picture at the bottom of the screen. You will have way more better mental health if you'll clean the mess, if you'll organize it, whether that's your office, whether that's your garage or your junk room, go in, clean it out, purge it out, you're going to have better mental health. That's an easy, easy fix. I also encourage you, and Sherry talked about this and David will more, consider a peer support program, consider having a police psychologist, either contract or work in your department, have people that come in that teach exercise, mindfulness, meditation, and yoga, and have people that come in to talk prevention, stress management, financial counseling, et cetera. And a few other ideas. Think about having a quiet room. This is a place where people can go and decompress. Think about bringing in people to do massage therapy. You can hook up with massage schools around the country, and they can actually have to do um, free massages for people to get their license. So hook up with a massage place and have them come in. Their new students come in and give you massages. And then finally, my personal favorite is get a therapy dog. Now, these are great ambassadors in your community and help build bridges and serve victims in your community, but the dog is also a super great wellness tool for your own employees. So I encourage you, consider that, reach out if you have questions, and I can help you. Now I'm going to turn it over to David. David, I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Got it. Thank you. Got me now? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Sherry and Dr. Miller, that was wonderful. I appreciate what you guys have uh, shared. Just incredible knowledge. And I want to thank everyone for your everyone for your time today. I know we all have choices. We all have things to do. So um, for all of you out there that's part of this presentation, I appreciate it. Um, and what an incredible job the NSA with, with Christy has done setting this up with ICP and COPS and um, CROTAC. So just an honor and privilege to be a part of this. I want to do uh, 
an overview of, of our wellness section uh, within Nashville Police Department. Uh, and I don't want to spend the entire time on that, but I want to give you some historical background on what we're doing here. Um, it's my privilege to manage uh, the professional wellness section underneath the Metro Nashville Police Department. Our police department has about 2,000 employees, uh, about 1,400 are sworn, uh, 500, 600 are, are civilian. Um, in 1986, we developed, uh, a single person uh, developed a counseling unit program to, to work with officers who were experiencing stress, uh, relationship issues, anxiety, depression. That program has grown uh, considerably over the, over the decades. Uh, it is now comprised of a, uh, a clinical supervisor, three full-time psychotherapists, all are professionally licensed here within the state of Tennessee, all are civilians. Um, the counseling unit, I call it the three T's. Their primary functions are, are therapy, training, and trauma support. Uh, the, the biggest piece of, of the therapeutic program, uh, as you might guess, um, the, the number one presenting issue that we see is, is relationships. And I know uh, Sherry and Dr. Miller both talked about the impact of policing on marriages and couples and relationships and families. About a third of the individuals that uh, on an annual basis are experiencing some some stress within relationships. For for some context, last year we opened up over 300 new counseling cases. We provided over 3,500 sessions, and I've had people say, "Wow, your your department is really sick. That's a lot of people that are seeking counseling." I I, I challenge that. I think it's the exact opposite. I think it's people that have the courage to step forward and say, "Hey, I, I want to be better. I want to change. I want to be a better." Uh, husband, wife, spouse, I want to be a better officer. I want to be, I, I want to change what I can change. So um, I can tell you those numbers have gotten progressively higher over the years. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about stigma today, uh, but that's something that we constantly have to, to be aware of. The training piece, and I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but um, we're very uh, proactive in that. We, we meet with all the trainees. Uh, the family members of the trainees, we do in-service training on a variety of things, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the trauma support piece, all of our uh, clinicians are certified in the uh, CISM uh, Mitchell model to do critical incident stress uh, debriefings, diffusings. Uh, as you know, um, critical incidents are, are not something that you're going to avoid. It's something that's, that's inevitable, uh, and so we, we feel good about that. I will tell you this, um, when I got here in 2007, I felt like this program, um, w w it was an incredible honor to, to me to, to come on board and be a supervisor and, and to watch this program grow. But one thing that I knew about even, even uh, 13, 14 years ago was that our program was, was leaning really heavy towards, um, I think, reactive. We were really good uh, if, if somebody needed counseling. We were good at, at, at providing those those clinical skills. If there was a critical incident, we were really good about running out and, and doing the briefings. What I think we weren't so good at was was being proactive. And um, I, I think one thing that we worked on. If I can change the slide here. There we go. One of the things that that I saw a need for, and we saw a need for years ago, was was to be more more proactive. I know Dr. Miller and Sherry both talked a little bit about that. Um, just to, to have services available that, that were 24-7, 365 days a year that didn't necessarily have to do with anything therapeutic or clinical or a reaction to a, to a critical incident. So we fought hard for this. You're going to see the number up there. The wellness unit started in 2020. That's something that we have really worked for for a long time. A wellness unit, the way we define it is we have a sworn side and we have a civilian side. So the civilians take care of all the, the counseling. On the sworn side, we now have a 20-year uh, veteran sergeant. We have another sworn officer, a sworn chaplain. Uh, we're about to add another sworn this fall or winter. We're really excited about that. The wellness unit, uh, in, it has different programs. Uh, our peer support program, probably five years ago, we probably had 30 or 40 peer supporters. Uh, our new wellness unit, the sergeant has now trained another 100 people. So we're really proud that we have 150 peer supporters. And it's the right people, right? We know that. You can't just uh, have anybody doing that. It's a really commitment. It's a passion. It, it's a desire to, to connect with your brothers and sisters and help them at all times. So 
Uh, family support I'll talk a little bit about. Um, some of the things we do is reaching out to, to, to spouses uh, and, 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 and the family members before a class starts. Veteran support, a couple of weeks ago, we, we had, a, um, we had a, a, a wife who was pregnant and had a kid. Her husband was, was serving overseas and she was getting ready to move. Uh, we pulled together peer supporters and other people within our department and moved her out of a two-story, probably 3,000 square foot home in just a couple of hours. We had 12, 15, 20 people that were helping, so things like that. Uh, wellness outreach, we believe um, that, again, it, it's important to stay on top of things. We have our, our wellness unit every day. They check the um, field reports, the summary reports overnight, and they're reaching out to officers in real time, officers that maybe had to provide CPR uh, on a newborn, or maybe they worked a fatal crash, or or maybe we learn that, that someone's going through um, something personal. So we're trying to stay connected. Um, we just started a mentoring program. We're going to model that program after Indianapolis. Uh, we love the folks in Indianapolis. Um, but we that is just now starting. But I think that's going to be great to pair up all the, the trainees with, with somebody that can help them navigate. Um, our mission, uh, again, is to provide quality, free, confidential services. We believe in the hire to retire uh, for our officers and their families. It's critical, imperative to have support from the top down. We are very blessed that we have a mayor in our city. We have a police chief, uh, a chief of police. Uh, we have an FOP that supports us fully. Uh, you have to have that buy-in. Um, it's always been my mission, and I think it continues to this day, that you have to build trusting relationships. Uh, as you know, there is a stigma with mental health. There can be a stigma with, with wellness and therapy. So we spend a lot of time with the, with the trainees and their families, even before a class actually even begins. Uh, and we try to maintain and strengthen those relationships. It's something that's vitally important. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what, what degrees I have on my wall or how much experience I can sit here and tell you about all my programs that I've gone through. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, if I can't connect to those men and women that put on the uniform every single day. And so that's something that we never take for granted and we're always working on it. Um, what does wellness look like for us? Um, again, we have two family days. So the Saturday before a training class begins and then the Saturday before that class graduates. And that's about a 26 week period. So um, the Saturday before and the Saturday before the graduation we ask um, moms and dads and spouses and partners and siblings to come together. In a pre-COVID world, we would meet at the training academy. Uh, the last couple of family days, of course, have been just like we're doing right now on a webinar, Zoom, WebEx. Uh, we're making that work. Uh, and the focus is simple, but I think it's powerful. The focus is on building and maintaining healthy police families, healthy police officers, healthy relationships. Uh, and the things that we talk about in those family days are, are resiliency and stress management and how to communicate and how to regulate your emotions. Again, those are things that Dr. Miller and Sherry have talked about today, uh, but just giving them the, the skills and the encouragement and then giving them resources. And that's the message I always share with families is that uh, you can never have too much good support. You can, have, you can never have too much quality support. Uh, you should never feel alone. And I, and I mean that. It's uh uh, if you're having to work a horrible crash or you're struggling with a marriage or you're struggling with an addiction, uh, you should never feel like that, that you're out there on an island. Uh, you have resources. Uh, but we have a, a very strong resiliency training with, with all the classes. We spend up to um, 20 hours with each class. Ten, ten of those are the first week. Uh, just talking about things like self-care, relaxation, stress management. I'm not going to read all that to you. We have a very extensive suicide prevention program here. Uh, I read uh, recently within the last couple of years that less than 10% of all uh, police departments have a, a, a curriculum on suicide prevention. As, as Sherry has talked about, uh, it, it's certainly a, a, a passion for all of us to, to get those numbers down. And I do agree with you, Sherry. I, I do think that's one thing that I hear is that these guys, these men and women are busy. They're, they're, that's what I keep hearing. They're, they're in the battle right now. Uh, just alone in Nashville, not only have we had of course, the COVID, we've had two major storms. We had a tornado a Category 3 that ripped through here in March right before COVID. We had a second wind storm that came through that was even more damaging than the tornado. We've had uh, multiple officer-involved shootings. We've had, uh, just this past week, we had 
uh, an officer who was at home with his family and somebody, someone fired shots into his home. So these guys are in the battle of surviving every single day. So those are the things that we try to teach, just how to regulate the emotion, how to, how to get from day to day. Uh, and then we do annual in-service training. We believe in that, that just continuing to build those. It's not just enough to connect with the trainees and the families. Of course, we're going to continue uh, to work with those officers moving forward. Um, what did we do unique in 2020? I think that's important for me to talk about really quick. I think 2020, again, whether it's the tornadoes or COVID, uh, the civil unrest, uh, is real-time support. It's not enough for us just to sit back and wait. Uh, again, I think there was a time that our unit would sit back and wait for people to come to us and, oh, you're dealing with post-traumatic stress, you're dealing with anxiety, you're dealing with addictions, uh, we'll help you with that. And I think we did a good job with that. But I think we've learned over the last couple of years, uh, especially the last five years, but in 2020 especially, we're not going to sit back and wait for you to call us. And so I call this real-time support. We would meet our officers um, and I put Music City Center, it's our major conference center in downtown Nashville. It was sort of a staging area for our police officers, and they would go out uh, during the civil unrest. We had protests, we had riots, we had our, our courthouse was set on fire one night, and we would meet them there before. We would meet them when they would come back for dinner. We would meet them there when they left in the night, and just building those relationships. We did the same thing during the tornado. We contacted every single person who was impacted uh, by, by those storms. So we believe in that. Um, we have two wonderful therapists here that I work with that developed a peer or a family support webinar group. Well, that was an awesome idea. So as we've talked about, and, and Sherry gave some incredible uh, information and data on that, we got, we got spouses and partners and family members at home that are really impacted by this. And we, we certainly didn't want to forget about them, and we didn't. So since March, we've offered weekly, sometimes multiple times a week, uh, family support webinars where we could just uh, have a, have a space, have a place for for family members to 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 support each other, to vent, to manage stress, and to offer resources. And of course, I'm not going to talk too much about the last thing. We um, it, uh, immediately in March we all learned how to use uh, Zoom and WebEx, and so we we certainly adapted. Even though our office is just now opened back up uh, for face to face. Uh, we, we were quickly able, uh, with the help of a lot of smart people, to jump in and start doing virtual therapy. Um, it's not the same as face-to-face, -face, but we have certainly made it work. Um, I want to talk, the last two minutes, I want to talk about our wellness check program. I mean, this is, this is something that I think is, 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 has been critical to us. It's a program that we've really tried to build for the last seven years. Again, as you know, as many of us know, not everyone is going to step forward and say, hey, I need help, I need therapy, I need counseling. Uh, again, there still is a stigma. I think there will always be a stigma when it comes to counseling. I wish I had the magic uh, answer or button for that. Um, but a wellness check uh, is something that, that we believe strongly in, and we try to offer these uh, just on a daily basis. And so a wellness check is a supportive intervention. It can be provided by myself, one of the counselors, uh, one of the members of the sworn wellness team, our chaplains, our peer supporters. Uh, and it's just a chance to connect. It, it, it sounds simple, but I believe there's a lot of power to it. It's a chance to connect with another person, to give them a place uh, to process, to talk, uh, to vent. And then for, for you, uh, our role is to listen. Our role is to show empathy and to provide uh, resources if needed. It has to be confidential. It has to be 100% confidential. Um, and I think we've, what we've done here, we, we've broken our wellness checks down into five primary areas. A general wellness check, it can happen anywhere, anytime. It could be me or another person going to a roll call or seeing someone on the street or just checking in with them. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, getting getting the overview of what maybe is going on in their life. Uh, six or seven years ago, we started doing annual wellness checks for a select group of people. And I know we have a smart audience today. I bet if you read through there and you see CSI, homicide, crisis, uh, SWAT, fatal, sex crimes, <clears throat> I bet you can, excuse me, I bet you can come up with a theme there. Those are all uh, divisions and specialized units that are exposed to a high amount of trauma. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to ignore the patrol officers, but those groups are, are individuals that typically can sometimes get skipped over uh, when it comes to wellness checks and, and debriefing. So we, once a year, we bring those folks in, and I'm going to talk about that quickly. A uh, stress wellness check, is just when someone is going through a personal or, or professional stress and we reach out to them, 
same with the crisis would be a critical incident and then doing follow-ups. I'm going to go fast here. Here's some of the things that we might do during an annual wellness check. Just talk to them about their current assignment. What do they like? What do they not like? Um, what have been some of the challenges? What have been some of the success stories of the past year? Helping them identify any critical incidents that maybe have stuck with them. I have a one of my favorite lieutenants here. He talks about he keeps a running journal. His first critical incident, his worst, and his last. And it's not to tell war stories. It's for him to understand how he copes and how he manages his emotions as he goes through his career. So I think that's a great idea of just keeping and monitoring your own self. We want to talk to people about get uh, about their support systems and their coping skills uh, and evaluate things at home. And finally, uh, our a typical annual wellness check will take place here. We can meet you in the field if we need to. It's not therapy. It's, it doesn't have to be structured. Uh, and then we can provide those to anyone within the department, both civilian and sworn. So I appreciate your time. I'm going to kick this back over to, I believe, Christy. And I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you, David. I want to thank our presenters, Sherry, Dr. Miller, and David, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, here's their contact information if you have questions. Next slide, please. I also want to thank the COPS office, ICP, and our CRITAC partnership who made this webinar possible. The recording of this webinar will be posted on our website at sheriff.org. Please also visit collaborativereform.org to see how you can receive free training and technical assistance through our CRITAC program. Again, feel free to email me at kbarksdale at sheriff.org or the presenters directly with your questions. Thank you all for your time today. Have a great day.